Part ten of Tom Jones being Book three, chapters seven, eight, nine, and ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 7. In which the author himself makes his appearance on the stage. Though Mr. Allworthy was not of himself hasty to see things in a disadvantageous light, and was a stranger to the public voice, which seldom reaches to a brother or a husband, though it rings in the ear of all the neighbourhood, yet was this affection of Mrs. Blifil to Tom, and the preference which she too visibly gave him to her own son, of the utmost disadvantage to that youth. For such was the compassion which inhabited Mr. Allworthy's mind, that nothing but the steel of justice could ever subdue it. To be unfortunate in any respect was sufficient, if there was no demerit to counterpoise it, to turn the scale of that good man's pity, and to engage his friendship and his benefaction. When, therefore, he plainly saw Master Blifil was absolutely detested, for that he was, by his own mother, he began, on that account only, to look with an eye of compassion upon him, and what the effects of compassion are in good and benevolent minds, I need not here explain to most of my readers. Henceforward he saw every appearance of virtue in the youth through the magnifying end, and viewed all his faults with the glass inverted, so that they became scarce perceptible. And this perhaps the amiable temper of pity may make commendable. But the next step the weakness of human nature alone must excuse, for he no sooner perceived that preference which Mrs. Blifil gave to Tom, than that poor youth, however innocent, began to sink in his affections as he rose in hers. This, it is true, would of itself alone never have been able to eradicate Jones from his bosom, but it was greatly injurious to him, and prepared Mr. Allworthy's mind for those impressions which afterwards produced the mighty events that will be contained hereafter in this history and to which, it must be confessed, the unfortunate lad, by his own wantonness, wildness, and want of caution, too much contributed. In recording some instances of these, we shall, if rightly understood, afford a very useful lesson to those well-disposed youths who shall hereafter be our readers. For they may here find that goodness of heart and openness of temper, though these may give them great comfort within, and administer to an honest pride in their own minds, will by no means, alas, do their business in the world. Prudence and circumspection are necessary even to the best of men. They are indeed, as it were, a guard to virtue, without which she can never be safe. It is not enough that your designs, nay, that your actions, are intrinsically good. You must take care they shall appear so, if your inside be never so beautiful, you must preserve a fair outside also. This must be constantly looked to, or malice and envy will take care to blacken it so, that the sagacity and goodness of an Allworthy will not be able to see through it, and to discern the beauties within. Let this, my young readers, be your constant maxim, that no man can be good enough to enable him to neglect the rules of prudence nor will virtue herself look beautiful, unless she be bedecked with the outward ornaments of decency and decorum. And this precept, my worthy disciples, if you read with due attention, you will, I hope, find sufficiently enforced by examples in the following pages. I ask pardon for this short appearance by way of chorus on the stage. It is in reality for my own sake, that while I am discovering the rocks on which innocence and goodness often split, I may not be misunderstood to recommend the very means to my worthy readers by which I intend to show them they will be undone. And this, as I could not prevail on any of my actors to speak, I was obliged to declare myself. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 a childish incident, in which, however, is seen a good-natured disposition in Tom Jones. The 
The reader may remember that Mr. Allworthy gave Tom Jones a little horse, as a kind of smart money for the punishment which he imagined he had suffered innocently. This horse Tom kept above half a year, and then rode him to a neighbouring fair, and sold him. At his return, being questioned by Thwackham, what he had done with the money for which the horse was sold, he frankly declared he would not tell him. Aho! said Thwackham, you will not? Then I will have it out of your brother. That being the place to which he always applied for information on every doubtful occasion. Tom was now mounted on the back of a footman, and everything prepared for the execution, when Mr. Allworthy, entering the room, gave the criminal a reprieve, and took him with him into another apartment where Mr. Allworthy, being only present with Tom, he put the same question to him which Thwackham had before asked him. Tom answered he could in duty refuse him nothing, but as for that tyrannical rascal, he would never make him any other answer than with a cudgel, with which he hoped soon to be able to pay him for all his barbarities. Mr. Allworthy very severely reprimanded the lad for his indecent and disrespectful expressions concerning his master, but much more for his avowing an intention of revenge. He threatened him with the entire loss of his favour, if he ever heard such another word from his mouth, for, he said, he would never support or befriend a reprobate. By these and the like declarations he extorted some compunction from Tom in which that youth was not over-sincere, for he really meditated some return for all the smarting favours he had received at the hands of the pedagogue. He was, however, brought by Mr. Allworthy to express a concern for his resentment against Thwackham, and then the good man, after some wholesome admonition, permitted him to proceed, which he did as follows. "'Indeed, my dear sir, I love and honour you more than all the world.' I know the great obligations I have to you, and should detest myself if I thought my heart was capable of ingratitude. Could the little horse you gave me speak, I am sure he could tell you how fond I was of your present, for I had more pleasure in feeding him than in riding him. Indeed, sir, it went to my heart to part with him, nor would I have sold him upon any other account in the world than what I did. You yourself, sir, I am convinced, in my case, would have done the same." for none ever so sensibly felt the misfortunes of others. What would you feel, dear sir, if you thought yourself the occasion of them? Indeed, sir, there never was any misery like theirs. Like whose child? said Allworthy. What do you mean? Oh, sir, answered Tom, your poor gamekeeper, with all his large family, ever since your discarding him, have been perishing with all the miseries of cold and hunger. I could not bear to see those poor wretches naked and starving and at the same time know myself to have been the occasion of all their sufferings. I could not bear it, sir, upon my soul, I could not. Here the tears run down his cheeks, and he thus proceeded. It was to save them from absolute destruction I parted with your dear present, notwithstanding all the value I had for it. I sold the horse for them, and they have every farthing of the money." Mr. Allworthy now stood silent for some moments, and before he spoke the tears started from his eyes. He at length dismissed Tom with a gentle rebuke, advising him for the future to apply to him in cases of distress, rather than to use extraordinary means of relieving them himself. This affair was afterwards the subject of much debate between Thwackham and Square. Thwackham held that this was flying in Mr. Allworthy's face, who had intended to punish the fellow for his disobedience. He said, in some instances, what the world called charity, appeared to him to be opposing the will of the Almighty, which had marked some particular person for destruction, and that this was in like manner acting in opposition to Mr. Allworthy, concluding, as usual, with a hearty recommendation of Birch. Square argued strongly on the other side, in opposition perhaps to Mr. Thwackham, or in compliance with Mr. Allworthy, who seemed very much to approve what Jones had done. As to what he urged on this occasion, as I am convinced most of my readers will be much abler advocates for poor Jones, it would be impertinent to relate it. Indeed, it was not difficult to reconcile, to the rule of right, an action which it would have been impossible to deduce from the rule of wrong. End of chapter 8
Chapter 9 Containing an incident of a more heinous kind with the comments of Thwackham and Square. It hath been observed by some man of much greater reputation for wisdom than myself that misfortunes seldom come single. An instance of this may, I believe, be seen in those gentlemen who have the misfortune to have any of their rogueries detected. For here discovery seldom stops till the whole is come out. Thus it happened to poor Tom, who was no sooner pardoned for selling the horse, than he was discovered to have some time before sold a fine Bible, which Mr. Allworthy gave him, the money arising from which sale he had disposed in the same manner. This Bible Master Bliffill had purchased, though he had already such another of his own, partly out of respect for the book, and partly out of friendship to Tom, being unwilling that the Bible should be sold out of the family at half price. He therefore deposited the said half price himself, for he was a very prudent lad, and so careful of his money, that he had laid up almost every penny which he had received from Mr. Allworthy. Some people have been noted to be able to read in no book but their own. On the contrary, from the time when Master Bliffill was first possessed of this Bible, he never used any other. Nay, he was seen reading in it much oftener than he had before been in his own. Now, as he frequently asked Thwackham to explain difficult passages to him, that gentleman unfortunately took notice of Tom's name, which was written in many parts of the book. This brought on an inquiry which obliged Master Bliffill to discover the whole matter. Thwackham was resolved a crime of this kind, which he called sacrilege, should not go unpunished. He therefore proceeded immediately to castigation, and not contented with that, he acquainted Mr. Allworthy at their next meeting, with this monstrous crime, as it appeared to him, inveighing against Tom in the most bitter terms, and likening him to the buyers and sellers who were driven out of the temple. Square saw this matter in a very different light. He said he could not perceive any higher crime in selling one book than in selling another, that to sell Bibles was strictly lawful by all laws, both divine and human, and consequently there was no unfitness in it. He told Thwackham that his great concern on this occasion brought to mind the story of a very devout woman, who, out of pure regard to religion, stole Tillotson's sermons from a lady of her acquaintance. This story caused a vast quantity of blood to rush into the parson's face, which of itself was none of the palest, and he was going to reply with great warmth and anger, had not Mrs. Bliffill, who was present at this debate, interposed. That lady declared herself absolutely of Mr. Square's side. She argued, indeed, very learnedly in support of his opinion, and concluded with saying, if Tom had been guilty of any fault, she must confess her own son appeared to be equally culpable, for that she could see no difference between the buyer and the seller, both of whom were alike to be driven out of the temple. Mrs. Bliffill, having declared her opinion, put an end to the debate. Square's triumph would almost have stopped his words had he needed them, and Thwackham, besides that, for reasons before mentioned, he durst not venture at disobliging the lady, was almost choked with indignation. And to Mr. Allworthy, he said, since the boy had been already punished, he would not deliver his sentiments on the occasion, and whether he was or was not angry with the lad, I must leave to the reader's own conjecture. Soon after this, an action was brought against the gamekeeper by Squire Weston, a gentleman in whose manner the partridge was killed, for depredations of the like kind. This was a most unfortunate circumstance for the fellow, as it not only of itself threatened his ruin, but actually prevented Mr. Allworthy from restoring him to his favour. For as that gentleman was walking out one evening with Master Bliffill and young Jones, the latter slyly drew him to the habitation of Black George, where the family of that poor wretch, namely his wife and children, were found in all the misery with which cold, hunger, and nakedness can affect human creatures for as to the money they had received from Jones, former debts had consumed almost the whole. Such a scene as this could not fail of affecting the heart of Mr. Allworthy. He immediately gave the mother a couple of guineas, with which he bid her clothe her children. The poor woman burst into tears at this goodness, 
and while she was thanking him could not refrain from expressing her gratitude to Tom, who had, she said, long preserved both her and hers from starving. "'We have not,' says she, "'had a morsel to eat, nor have these poor children had a rag to put on, but what his goodness hath bestowed on us. For indeed, besides the horse and the Bible, Tom had sacrificed a nightgown and other things to the use of this distressed family.' On their return home, Tom made use of all his eloquence to display the wretchedness of these people, and the penitence of Black George himself, and in this he succeeded so well, that Mr. Allworthy said he thought the man had suffered enough for what was past, that he would forgive him, and think of some means of providing for him and his family. Jones was so delighted with this news, that though it was dark when they returned home, he could not help going back a mile in a shower of rain to acquaint the poor woman with the glad tidings. But, like other hasty divulgers of news, he only brought on himself the trouble of contradicting it, for the ill fortune of Black George made use of the very opportunity of his friend's absence to overturn all again. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 in which Master Bliffil and Jones appear in different lights. Master Bliffil fell very short of his companion in the amiable quality of mercy. But he has greatly exceeded him in one of a much higher kind, namely in justice, in which he followed both the precepts and example of Thwackham and Square. For though they would both make frequent use of the word mercy, yet it was plain that in reality Square held it to be inconsistent with the rule of right, and Thwackham was for doing justice and leaving mercy to heaven. The two gentlemen did indeed somewhat differ in opinion concerning the objects of this sublime virtue, by which Thwackham would probably have destroyed one half of mankind, and Square the other half. Master Bliffill then, Though he had kept silence in the presence of Jones, yet, when he had better considered the matter, could by no means endure the thought of suffering his uncle to confer favours on the undeserving. He therefore resolved immediately to acquaint him with the fact which we have above slightly hinted to readers, the truth of which was as follows. The gamekeeper, about a year after he was dismissed from Mr. Allworthy's service, and before Tom selling the horse, being in want of bread, either to fill his own mouth or those of his family, as he passed through a field belonging to Mr. Weston, espied a hare sitting in her form. This hare he had basely and barbarously knocked on the head against the laws of the land, and no less against the laws of sportsmen. The higgler to whom the hare was sold, being unfortunately taken many months after with a quantity of game upon him, was obliged to make his peace with the squire by becoming evidence against some poacher. And now Black George was pitched upon by him, as being a person already obnoxious to Mr. Weston, and one of no good fame in the country. He was, besides, the best sacrifice the Higgler could make, as he had supplied him with no game since, and by this means the witness had an opportunity of screening his better customers. For the squire, being charmed with the power of punishing Black George, whom a single transgression was sufficient to ruin, made no further inquiry. Had this fact been truly laid before Mr. Allworthy, it might probably have done the gamekeeper very little mischief. But there is no zeal blinder than that which is inspired with the love of justice against offenders. Master Bliffill had forgot the distance of the time. He varied likewise in the manner of the fact and by the hasty addition of the single letter S, he considerably altered the story, for he said that George had wired hares. These alterations might probably have been set right, had not Master Bliffill unluckily insisted on a promise of secrecy from Mr. Allworthy, before he revealed the matter to him. But by that means the poor gamekeeper was condemned, without having any opportunity to defend himself. For as the fact of killing the hare, and of the action brought, were certainly true, Mr. Allworthy had no doubt concerning the rest. Short-lived, then, was the joy of these poor people, for Mr. Allworthy the next morning declared he had fresh reason, without assigning it, for his anger, 
and strictly forbade Tom to mention George any more, though as for his family he said he would endeavour to keep them from starving, but as to the fellow himself he would leave him to the laws, which nothing could keep him from breaking. Tom could by no means divine what had incensed Mr. Allworthy, for of Master Blifil he had not the least suspicion. However, as his friendship was to be tired out by no disappointments, he now determined to try another method of preserving the poor gamekeeper from ruin. Jones was lately grown very intimate with Mr. Weston. He had so greatly recommended himself to that gentleman, by leaping over five-barred gates, and by other acts of sportsmanship, that the squire had declared Tom would certainly make a great man, if he had but sufficient encouragement. He often wished he had himself a son with such parts, and one day very solemnly asserted at a drinking bout, that Tom should hunt a pack of hounds for a thousand pound of his money, with any huntsman in the whole county. By such kind of talents he had so ingratiated himself with the squire, that he was a most welcome guest at his table, and a favourite companion in his sport. Everything which the squire held most dear, to wit his guns, dogs, and horses, were now as much at the command of Jones, as if they had been his own. He resolved, therefore, to make use of this favour on behalf of his friend Black George, whom he hoped to introduce into Mr. Weston's family, in the same capacity in which he had before served Mr. Allworthy. The reader, if he considers that this fellow was already obnoxious to Mr. Weston, and if he considers farther the weighty business by which that gentleman's displeasure had been incurred, will perhaps condemn this as a foolish and desperate undertaking. But if he should not totally condemn young Jones on that account, he will greatly applaud him for strengthening himself with all imaginable interest on so arduous an occasion. For this purpose, then, Tom applied to Mr. Weston's daughter, a young lady of about seventeen years of age, whom her father, next after those necessary implements of sport just before mentioned, loved and esteemed above all the world. Now, as she had some influence on the squire, so Tom had some little influence on her. But this being the intended heroine of this work, a lady with whom we are ourselves greatly in love, and with whom many of our readers will probably be in love too before we part, it is by no means proper she should make her appearance at the end of a book. End of chapter 10 End of book 3